In this video, we're going to do a really fun thing, which is I'm going to teach you how to generate text with LSTMs. I don't know anyone that doesn't find this compelling. So if you haven't been following along, this is one where it's just super fun to follow along and generate your own text. And I'll show you one of my favorite examples. There's so many of them. If you've seen like crazy gerbil names or band names or human names generated by machine learning, in this case, it's machine learning generated pranks. And you can find more of them on AIWeirdness.com. <laughs> but they actually did exactly what we're doing today. They fed an LSTM a whole bunch of different kinds of things, different kinds of pranks, I guess. And it learned a language model around that. And then it generated new pranks. So how did this actually work? How did recurrent neural networks that we saw predicting time series generate these crazy pranks? What we do is we actually take text, and typically this is on a character level. We take each individual character in a body of text. We take each character and we one-hot encode it. And if you remember, what that means is we basically make a vector where each element in the vector corresponds to a different character. And so here I have my name Lucas, right? So the third element is an L. And so our vector has the third element set to 1 and the other one's 0. And then we say the first element of this vector, I guess, corresponds to u. So the second vector that goes into our network is a 1 followed by zeros. And the fourth element is a k. So the third vector that we put in is a, all zeros except for the, the fourth element set to 1. And we feed this series of vectors into our recurrent neural network. And our network passes through some kind of state, which is hopefully encoding something about the world. And it's also outputting a vector. And this output vector is typically the same length as our input vector, so we can use the same encoding to know what it means. And in this case, the network will typically output a whole set of different numbers. But what we want it to do, what we train it to do, is output the next letter at each state. So we're actually training our network to take input letters and at each step predict what the next letter is going to be. So then when we run this network into the future after we've trained it, it generates plausible sounding words and pieces of text. OK, let's go to the code. First, go into the ML class directory, then go into the videos directory, and then go into text gen. There's one file in here, car-gen.py. So lines 1 through 13, as usual, they're just importing various things that we're going to use. And lines 15 through 18 is actually a little thing that I set up for you so that you can easily change the input text that you want. So this code will actually take in any text and it'll learn a language model based on that text and try to predict things that look like the text that you passed in as the first argument as input. Lines 20 through 26 set up a whole bunch of configuration parameters. In this case, maybe the most important configuration parameter is actually config.maxlen, which is going to be the length of that sliding window of how many characters we look at as input into our recurrent neural network. Lines 28 and 29 actually open up the file and pull out the individual characters. And then lines 31 and 32 set up a mapping from the character to indices and then back from the indices to the character, setting the stage for building this one hot encoded vector for each character that we might see in our text. Lines 36 through 40 pull out that sliding window. And in this case, the window size, as I said, was max len. And actually, we're only going to take that window every config.step times that we see it. So we might slide that window and set it over by 1. In this case, we're going to slide it over by 3 at each step. Lens 45 through 50 actually build up that matrix that we were talking about. So in this case, we want x to be a two-dimensional thing. This is going to be input. And the you can think of the rows here as being um, each individual character, and the columns being the one hot encoded value of each character. So in this case, x is the input, and y is the output that we're looking for. Line 52, we set up a sequential neural network architecture. Line 53, we add a simple recurrent neural network. And the important parameter we pass in here is 128. And if you remember, that means that this network is outputting 128 numbers. And it's also passing the same 128 numbers across to the next step in the recurrent network. Now, 
we're not outputting 128 numbers. We're actually outputting as many numbers as different types of characters that we saw in our text. So in order to make our output dimension match our Y or the data we're trying to predict, we need to add a dense layer. And in this case, our dense layer is outputting exactly as many numbers as we have different types of characters in our data set. In other words, len cars. And we set the activation function to be softmax. In this case, it's really important because we actually are, act we actually are predicting categories. In this case, each character is a different category that we're trying to predict. And then we call model.compile. And we set our loss function to be categorical cross entropy, again, because we're outputting categories of things. And here we set our optimizer to RMS prop, but you could also use the atom optimizer if you want to be consistent with previous videos. So lines 58 through 65 actually has a sample function. And here what the sample function does is it makes a prediction of the next character in the text, but it actually adds a little bit of noise. So essentially, it weights the prediction that it's going to make by the output number, where the output number of this network is the probability that it thinks a different character is coming next. And the reason to not just output the highest probability answer as the next character is because it makes the thing more interesting if sometimes it throws a little bit of a curveball. So we want to show the types of things this network is predicting, not necessarily always the thing that this network thinks is the most probable next thing. And then sample text, actually, at the end of each epic, it's a callback that makes some predictions on the text, one with a little bit lower diversity and one with a little bit higher diversity. So lower diversity numbers will tend to output more boring things or more things that are exactly like the input text that we saw. Higher diversity will make the network try a little bit more surprising characters. So we'll get a little bit maybe less realistic, but maybe more interesting outputs from a network. So you could try changing 0.5 or 1.2 here to different numbers and see what this network outputs for you. So finally, line 97 calls model.fit on x and y. And here, you know, x is that one hot encoded character vector, and y is the next character in the sequence. Batch size is the usual thing of how many uh, x's and y's to show the network at one batch or at one time. We set epics to be 100. This is going to take a while to run. And we have two callbacks here. One is the, the typical W and B callback that lets us see the loss function over time and lets us view the data as it runs. And then also sample text, which is actually going to generate some examples of the text based on the input data that we see. So let's try running cargen.py. I have a whole bunch of interesting different text files that you can run this on. So I have book.txt, which is some um, free novel that I got of Gutenberg's um, free book collection. I also have female.txt and male.txt, which is actually lists of male and female names. And then I have lucascode.txt, which is actually all the code that I wrote in this repository. So you can maybe feed this in and see if you can generate code. But let's take an easy example. Let's try running cargen on male.txt, which is a list of boy names. And then this network will try to predict new male names. So you can see that we feed into this network as input this chunk of lists of names. It's actually a raw 200 characters, including new lines, out of mail.txt. And then the network starts to make predictions. And at first, it outputs total gibberish, right? There's no pattern to what this network is outputting. This network will take you a little while to run, but it'll start to generate somewhat reasonable seeming boy names like Nier or Idar or Gewunte. But actually, there is some weird things that it's not learning. For example, in this data set, every single line starts with a single capital letter, and that's the only place that there's a capital letter. But this network is actually having trouble even knowing that. You'll see capital letters that are inserted in the middle of the text, in the middle of names. There's nowhere that we said you couldn't do that, so maybe it makes sense that it is doing that. But it does seem a little weird that it hasn't learned these kind of simple patterns um, from our data. So here's where an LSTM is actually going to make a big improvement. So what's the problem with simple recurrent neural networks? The problem is it's really hard for them to encode long-range dependencies. And it has to do with the way the network is actually constructed. So in this case, inside of each recurrent neural network is a perceptron that's dependent on the previous state and the input constructing the next state. So all it really is is a weighted sum and then an activation function applied to the input at that moment and the previous state. And so it's very hard for a network to keep the same state for a long period of time. 
right? Because if it's multiplying an input state by 0.99, if you apply that multiplication 20 times, it's actually going to be a pretty small number. So if we go, if we have an input at one state of a left parenthesis, we know that maybe 15, 20, 30 characters out, we're probably going to see a right parenthesis. But it's very hard for that network to remember that it saw a left parenthesis over more than four, five, six states because it keeps multiplying it by the same number, whatever that parameter is on the input state. Back in 1997, long short-term memory networks were invented to solve this problem, to be able to encode long-term state and also short-term state. And they're usually presented with a confusing set of equations. And what I'm going to try to do is explain what these equations mean and also give you some intuition around how LSTMs work and how you might modify them or where you might want to use them. So first of all, let's back up and look at what an LSTM is without digging into exactly what it does, right? So just like the simple recurrent neural network, it takes in an input vector and it outputs a vector. Now, one difference is that LSTMs actually maintain some state that they pass into the next, the next iteration that's different than what they output. So they're actually outputting a value and they're passing along a different value to the next iteration. That's different than a recurrent neural network. So the way LSTMs work is they really do four independent computations involving perceptrons with different sets of parameters. And then they use the output of those computations to decide what to pass to the next step in the LSTM and what to output. And actually each one of these computations kind of has an intuition built around it. So the first computation that this LSTM does is what to forget. And this is actually usually put in a variable called f sub t. And the F really does stand for forget. So this really is a perceptron where the input is actually the input from the top and the state from the previous step in the LSTM. So it takes those two and it concatenates them into a vector and flattens them out. And then it uses a dense layer or a perceptron to output exactly the same number of numbers as the state vector that came in from the previous step in the LSTM. And it typically uses a sigmoid activation function here. And the reason is that basically where this thing is outputting ones, it's going to keep values. And where it's going to output zeros, it's going to forget those values. So you'll see how that works in a second. The second computation that an LSTM does is it sort of decides what things to update. And this is exactly the same as the computation of what things to forget, but it uses a different set of parameters. So we take as input the input value from above and the state value from the previous step in the LSTM. And we output a different vector, the size of the state vector. In this case, the interpretation is one are things that the network should update and zeros are things that it doesn't want to update. The third calculation that it does is it decides kind of what new values it might want to use. So this is typically put in a variable called C with a tilde on the top, sub T. And this is exactly the same looking calculation, but it's a different set of parameters and a different set of outputs. And typically here, it doesn't use a sigmoid activation function in the perceptron. It uses that, it uses that inverse tangent that we talked about. The important thing to remember is that that can output numbers from negative 1 to 1. So these aren't just numbers between 0 and 1. They're numbers that could be from negative 1 to 1. The final calculation that a perceptron does is it decides basically what it should be outputting. So this takes in as values, again, the input concatenated with the previous state and outputs another set of numbers that's the same size as the state that it's passing through. And this is kind of telling it what numbers it should output to the next layer in the LSTM or into the dense layer that's going to finally determine what we're predicting. And we put this all together in a formula that I've written out. So the next state is actually equal to the previous state times the forget vector. So this is an element-wise times, right? So it's not a matrix a vector multiplication. It's basically doing a, it's doing an element-wise multiplication. So the things where the forget vector is set to 0, those states are essentially removed. And the things where the forget vector is set to 1, those states are kept and passed into the next state. And then it adds to that previous state in the update calculation times the new candidate states. So where the update activation is set to 0, it doesn't use the new candidate things. It just keeps what it had before. And where the update activation is set to 1, it, it passes across the complete value of the candidate updates. 
So how does the LSTM use these four values to decide what to pass into the next step in the LSTM and what to output? Well, the way it decides the next state is it takes its previous state, and the first thing it does is it multiplies the previous state by the forget vector. And so what happens here is basically where the forget vector is set to 0, those elements basically get removed. They get erased because anything times 0 is 0. And where the forget vector is set to 1, it keeps those elements because anything times 1 is itself. It takes that result and it adds the update activation times the candidate vector. And so here where the update activ activation is 0, it kind of ignores the candidate vector, basically passes through whatever it had. And where the update activation is set to 1, it does a complete update with some new value. So in this way, it's really easy for an LSTM to encode long-term memory. As long as that update activation is set to 0, and as long as the forget value is set to 1, that means that this thing is actually just passing into the next state exactly what it saw in the previous state. Then it actually outputs a value that's the output activation times typically the hyperbolic tangent of what it's passing through into the next state. So then the output is actually the output activation vector times an activation function of the next state that is passing through. So what this means is that the LSTM doesn't actually always have to output the same thing that is passing into the next value in the LSTM. This gives it more power to do different things. One more quick aside is that you'll often see the hard sigmoid function used instead of the sigmoid function. And so what this means is it's basically almost like a discretized version of the sigmoid, which really lets the LSTM pass out ones or zeros in a way that you'd never get exactly a one or exactly a zero from the sigmoid function. So actually, Keras uses this internally in the LSTM instead of the sigmoid function, and it can make the computation a little easier. So if all of these details feel really crazy to you and you're like wondering where they came from, it turns out that there is some research that says that they're actually all not really necessary. There are lots of ways to modify these calculations, and LSTMs still work reasonably well. But these calculations have some good properties. It allows the LSTM to keep long-term memory, which is super important, and it also allows us to efficiently do the backpropagation calculation. So you can imagine that calculating all these parameters inside of our LSTM across a lot of different states could be an expensive calculation, and it is. And so these operations that we have are really optimized to making that calculation as efficient as possible. And you'll appreciate that when you run LSTMs because even with this optimization, they're still pretty slow to find the optimal values. Here's the really important takeaway to know about LSTMs before we go back to the code, which is that LSTMs tend to be more powerful than simple RNNs, and they're much better at finding long-term dependencies, but they have more parameters and can be slower and can sometimes be more prone for overfitting. But it's actually really easy to add LSTMs to your code. If I go into CarGen and I scroll down where I see simple RNN here, I just change that to LSTM. I save my file, I kill my program, and now I can train my LSTM on mail names and see if it can learn more intricate, more expressive patterns. If you let this LSTM run for a while, and I really do mean a while, I think this took me 15 minutes to actually get this data out, you'll see that it learns much more certainty about boys' names. The names are more realistic, and it's not making basic mistakes. It's, it's actually never putting a capital letter after the first letter, and it's very rarely forgetting to capitalize the first letter in the name. In fact, because my input data was in alphabetical order, it funnily outputs boys' names in alphabetical order. <laughs> so you know, here we happen to give it as seed data um, things in H's. So we're getting things like Harare, Hersir, Harame. These really do feel like somewhat realistic um, boys' names. And I do have some other fun files in here. So I have, um, like I mentioned, uh, female names. I also have my code. So you can actually run this on my code and see if you can generate working code. This will be fun homework for you. Um, but before we go, I actually want to show you one more type of uh, recurrent neural network that you should know about, which is GRUs, or gated recurrent unit. LSTMs got super popular a few years ago, but they were actually invented a long time ago. And so some people went back and kind of looked at the assumptions behind LSTMs and wondered if they couldn't make something kind of more efficient or more principled. And so a gated recurrent unit is actually a simplified version of an LSTM 
that can often train faster and give you equivalent performance. So you can see that there are actually less equations here, and there's really two important differences. The first thing to know that's a major difference is that we're not passing a different value than we're outputting. So actually the output value here is the same value that the GRU passes into the next step. So that's not true of an LSTM, but it is true of a gated recurrent unit. The second thing is that we only have three vectors that we're calculating, not four. And the reason is that if you go back to an LSTM, it's sort of deciding what to forget and it's deciding what to update. And that might seem a little bit redundant, right? Because if, if you're forgetting it and you're not updating it, what are you really doing, right? So in this case, it sort of merges that sort of update vector and that forget vector into a single vector. So it basically has the update activation and that's set to basically be one minus the forget value. In this case, it's called Z of T for some reason, but it's one number that basically decides what to forget and what to update. So also very easy to try out gated recurrent units. We can go back into the code and where we see LSTM, we just change it to GRU and that adds a gated recurrent unit layer. And actually, when I run this, I find kind of what you'd expect from some of the theory or some of the results, which is that, you know, it basically runs about as well as an LSTM and trains a little bit faster. So today, we went through exactly how simple RNNs, LSTMs, and GRUs work. So hopefully you have an intuition about where you can apply them and why you should use them. But maybe more importantly, we saw for the first time how to take text and turn it into time series data and how to take that time series data and make predictions, and then how to use those predictions to make crazy pranks or internet memes generated by machine learning. So I think this is one of the most fun interactive sections, and you can take this code, you can literally take this code and take any data set that you want in any kind of character encoding, in any language you want, and generate all kinds of interesting predictions. And if you do make some interesting predictions, please send them to me. I would love to see what you come up with.